Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss secured transactions. Secured transactions are financial arrangement where a creditor, a creditor could be the bank, it could be the person that's selling you an item and asking you to pay later, giving you the right to pay later, and a debtor, somebody that's buying the item and paying later, or somebody that is borrowing the money. We have two parties, a creditor, and this creditor again could be a lender or it could be a bank, a lender is a bank, or it could be a seller. And we have a debtor, the person that's borrowing the money. In such transaction, the debtor buys something from the creditor, but does not pay for it immediately. Therefore, the seller, so think of the creditor, the seller, in that situation, the creditor could be the seller, the debtor is the buyer, where the buyer will pay for that something later. Now, obviously, the creditor has risk. Risk of what? Risk that the debtor don't pay their money later. Yes, they promise me to pay later, but they don't. We learned in the prior session what the creditor can do. The creditor can ask for a surety. Surety is basically another person or entity that guarantees that the debtor will pay. So if the debtor don't pay, someone else will pay. Or <clears throat> we can ask the debtor to put some sort of a collateral. Collateral means what? Means a secured interest. Collateral means they put some sort of an asset in case they don't pay, the creditor can take this asset, collateral. Collateral. So a collateral, think of it as a mortgage, although we're not going to be including mortgage in this session. Think of it when you buy a house. When you buy a house, your home is the mortgage, is the collateral. Here, the creditor is asking for a collateral. So the creditor takes a security interest in the personal property. Now, notice here, personal property. It means it's it's not a real property. A personal property is not a house. Personal property, we're going to see it's movable property. Personal property, we're going to define what, what these property are later on. But basically, we're looking at something of value that the creditor will have an interest in. So this interest, this security interest, works like a safety net for the creditor. So in case you did not pay, they can do what? They can possess it. They can take it back, sell it, and satisfy your debt. So a secure transaction is this legal agreement. It's a legal right to specific items that belongs to the debtor. So the debtor has items, a car, a computer, a phone, jewelry, whatever they have. It, they're giving the creditor the right to that in case they don't pay. This is what we'll be discussing in this session. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses, broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. Let's start by looking at an example, just to kind of make sure we have this idea down. Sarah wants to buy a high-end camera worth $1,000, but she does not have enough cash to pay for it. Well, she should not be paying it then. Uh, pay it. She should not be buying it. She goes to a camera store and agrees to buy the camera on credit. The store acting as the creditor, notice now the store is the seller as well as the creditor, agrees but asks Sarah to pledge her laptop as a collateral. So we told Sarah, okay, we'll, get, we'll sell you the camera. You don't have to pay us the $1,000. You'll pay it later. However, if you don't pay, we want your laptop as a collateral. They will for formalize this agreement. It means they put it down in writing. In the store, this camera store will have a security interest on the laptop. So this way they have a claim in case Sarah did not pay. This means if Sarah fails to pay the camera, uh, for the camera, as promised, the store has the legal right to take the laptop and recover their unpaid amount. Now, obviously, you want the laptop to be greater than at least $1,000 or more in case she did not pay. Few terms we need to be familiar with when it comes to secure transaction because this is an introduction to secure transaction, attachment and perfection. So in the context of secure transaction, we have to learn about three key concepts, attachment and perfection. 
starting with attachment. What is attachment? Attachment refer to the to the point when a security interest becomes enforceable between the creditor and the debtor. Attach it mean, attachment means you have you arrive to a to a point where there is a, an enforceable agreement between the debtor and the creditor. This is what attachment is. For a security interest to attach, certain condition must be met, such as, and we're going to look at those in the, the next session a little bit more in details, agreement. You have to have an agreement between the debtor and the, the debtor and the creditor, and the debtor having rights in the collateral. Think about it. If they're giving me a right into something, they cannot give me the right into their neighbor's computer, into their neighbor's laptop. They, they have to give me the right, the security interest, in their own laptop. So you have to have an agreement. And the debtor, the, the person that's making the promise, and, and in case I did not pay, you can have this. Whatever that this thing is, the debtor actually own it. It doesn't have to be own it or, yeah, they control it. They own it. They have rights and their collateral. Otherwise, uh, they can promise me anything. If it's not theirs, how good is it? So once the interest attaches, if the debtor fails to fulfill their obligation, the creditor can seize the collateral to settle the debt. <laughs> now, so so it's done then. It's great. Well, you have to remember, sometime the person pledging this asset, they might be also pledging this asset for other parties at the same time, or they might sell this asset, or might they might go into a bankruptcy. So there are other issues we have to deal with down the road. I just want you to understand what attachment is. That's all. So attachment alone does not protect the creditor's interest against the claim from third party who may also have interest in the same collateral. So what does that mean? It means remember Sarah, she put up her laptop as a collateral. Well, yes, she put that laptop for the camera. She also bought a phone from Apple and she, from another store, doesn't have to be Apple store. And she put her the same laptop at the Apple store and Apple store also had an attachment. So that that doesn't so so whose laptop is it? Is it the camera shop in case you didn't pay, or is it the phone place if she did not pay? We'll talk about that later. But the point is the attachment alone is not enough. We need perfection. That's why it's called attachment and perfection. After you attach, the next step to safeguard the creditor's interest is to do what? Perfect the attachment. By perfecting a security interest, the creditor the creditor publicly re records and records or announces their claim to the creditor. So now it's official that this asset is our collateral. <laughs> this is basically what you're doing in a, in a perfection. This process typically involves filing a financing statement or taking possession of the collateral. This is the best. If she gives you, if she handed over the laptop to the camera store, that's great. Guess what? Now you can have the camera and if you don't pay, I'm going to sell the laptop and get my money back. Or we file what's called the financing paper, not, nothing more than the agreement itself. So perfection essentially tells the world that the creditor has a priority claim over the collateral. Now, you could also have multiple perfection at the same time. We'll discuss that later. Making the rights superior to certain third parties who might also have an interest in the property. Again, how about if we have multiple parties with perfection. We'll talk about that later. I just want you to be familiar with the big picture for now. Lisa borrows $5,000 from a bank to buy musical equipment and pledges the equipment itself as a collateral. The bank and Lisa enter into an agreement and the bank's, sec and the bank's security interest in the equipment attaches. So notice how the equipment attaches. By entering into this agreement, they have a security attachment. The bank has a security attachment as soon as they enter this agreement. But if the bank wants to protect their interests against others, who are the others? Another lender that she might, that Lisa might use this music equipment to get a loan for, who might lend Lisa money in the future against the same equipment. So the bank needs to perfect its security interests in order to have a priority. The bank does this by filing a financing statement with the appropriate government body, which put others on notice on this claim. So that's what you have to do. Attach, then perfect. How did they attach? By entering into an agreement with Lisa. That's attachment. But to make it secure more, you perfect. How do you perfect? You file the financing statement. So if Lisa fails to repay the bank and also has a debt to other creditors, the bank perfected the interest. It means it has priority in claims uh, against the musical equipment over others. Now, again, 
How about if there's other perfection? We'll talk about that later. Let's talk about Article 9 of the Uniform Commercial Code. This article primarily governs security interests in personal property and fixture. Now, you don't have to know the article number, just FYI. Personal property refer to movable items. How about fixture? Fixture are personal property that has been attached to the real estate so significantly that they become part of it. For example, a bookshelf and the house that's attached to the property. Also, Article 9 governs what else? Covers outright sales of account receivable, which are debt owed to business. So it also covered that. We need to know what Article 9 does not cover. Why? Because it could be a multiple choice questions. When, we'll, when we're discussing Article 9, which is this is what we're going to be discussing for the CPA exam, it does not apply to security interests in, you guessed it, real estate, like mortgages, wages, wage claims, or statutory liens, such as mechanics lien, which are rights granted to workers who have repaired or improved property. This has nothing to do with Article 9. This could be, it could be an easy question. Let's discuss now purchase money security interest, PMSI, which is an aspect of Article 9. What is that? What is the PMSI? It's a special kind of security that, when properly perfected, takes precedence over other security interests in the same collateral. So if you have a PMSI, well, you have the priority. So this priority status is significant because it can determine who gets, who gets paid first in case assets are limited because you don't have enough unlimited assets. You have multiple creditors. If you have PMSI in that asset properly perfected, then it takes precedent. So when does the PMSI occurs? So when do we have PMSI? You need to understand this. It occurs in two main situation. When the seller, fi the seller finance PMSI, it's when you go to a store and you purchase an item from that store. Well, and the store itself, you enter into an agreement with the store and the store file. There we go. This happens when a creditor, who may also be a seller, provides the item to the debtor on credit and retain a security interest in that item for the amount of the purchase. An example would be if a business sells a computer to a customer and retain a security interest in the computer and, uh, until it's fully paid, this is called the seller financed PMSI. It means the seller is financing the transaction. The seller will have a priority because they have what's called PMSI. Without the seller, without the seller, there's no purchase. There's no purchase. So the seller helped the buyer purchase it. Therefore, if anything happened, the seller have the right to, to that property before anyone else. So one situation is we have seller financed PMSI. The second situation is third party financed PMSI, like a bank. How does that work? This occur when the creditor is not the seller, but provide funds. Who provide funds? A lender, a bank. Think about a bank. Specifically, for the purchasing of the item. So they didn't, they didn't only gave you the money, they gave you the money for that particular item. For example, for the car, for the refrigerator, for that TV, for that computer. And the creditor retained interest in the item that they gave the money for. Remember, the item has to be related to the money that they gave you. For instance, a bank, if a bank loans money to a person to buy a car and and retains a security interest in the car. This is the third party finance PMSI. Let's take a look at a few examples just to make sure we're all on the same page. Emma buys a $2,000 laptop on credit from TechWord. She signs a security agreement that grants TechWord a security interest in the laptop. Guess what? TechWord has a PMSI in the laptop because the credit they provided allow Emma to acquire the laptop. So they have priority over anyone else. Another example of third party finance PMSI. Jake approaches Quick Loan Bank for $500 to buy a new smartphone. The bank lends his money and Jake signs an agreement giving Quick Loan Bank a security interest in the smartphone itself. Guess what? Then they have a priority. Jake purchases the smartphone from Gadget Store. In this scenario, Quick Loan Bank hold the PMSI, not, not the Gadget Store. The person that financed the, the transaction to purchase that particular item, which is we gave you the money to buy the phone, you have a security interest with us. Let's take a look at a non-PSI security interest example. Sophia wants to borrow 1500 from her local bank, Green Bank. They agree. 
but asked for security's interest in Sophia's bicycle, which she already owned and did not buy with the loan. So she already has the bicycle. The money, 1500 has nothing to do with the bike. Now, Green Bank gets a security interest in the bicycle. They want to have something. So that's fine. But it's not a PMSI, as the bicycle were already, was already owned by Sophia and the bank funds were not used to buy it. They were not used to acquire it. Notice in each of these examples, the key to determining whether a security interest is a PMSI or not hinges on whether the credit or the loan provided was directly used to acquire the collateral in question. So keep that in mind. Let's talk about collateral a little bit more. We have four types of collateral under section uh, under Article 9 of the UCC. So the property pledge as security interest is categorized under four main categories. Each type have its own sets of rules and how the security interest is perfected. And we'll, we'll learn about those a little bit later. And how priority in the event of the debtor default occur. So understanding the four categories is crucial for both creditor and debtor. So let's look at the four categories first. We have goods, intangible goods, and semi-intangible collateral, investment property, and what we call the proceeds. We're going to look at each one of them separately, just, have, just to kind of have a good idea, getting ready for the next session. Goods. Under goods, this could be divided based on the use of the item of the debtor. So how is the debtor using the item rather than its intrinsic value? Goods could be consumer goods. For example, this is my car. I use it to go on vacation. I use it to shop. I use it for leisure. Item used primarily for personal family or household item. For example, a car used for personal transportation is a consumer good. So a good could be consumer good. Guess what? This same car, I'm holding it as inventory. I sell cars, items held by a business for sale or lease or to be supplied under a service contract along with raw material or work in process. A car is an, in an auto dealership intended for sale is classified as inventory. It could be the same car, but if I have a car dealership and I'm selling this car, it's inventory. Third category of goods is this car could be for my pizzeria. I have a pizzeria and I have a car that I give it to my workers to deliver pizza with it. Then the car is a property, plant, and equipment. Items used by a business that do not qualify as inventory. I'm not selling it. Now this is PP&E. The car, if I'm a dealer, it's an inventory. If I'm using it for my own personal use, then it's a personal property. So a car used by delivery vehicle for a business is considered equipment. Other types of collateral, we said we have intangibles and semi-intangible. This include non-physical rights, like account receivable. Here, account receivable is considered non-intangible. It's not the perfect definition, but account receivable is considered non-tangible. Or intellectual property, for example, um, rights to payment not evidenced by an instrument, chattel paper such as the amount owed to a doctor after a checkup. Those are intangibles or semi-intangible collateral. Investment property comprising financial assets like stocks, bonds, mutual fund. This type of collateral is typically seen in financial and investment context. And we could have something called proceeds. And this refers to anything acquired through the sale, exchange, collection, or other disposition of the collateral. So when you get rid of the collateral. For example, if the equipment used as a collateral is sold, the money received from that sale is classified as proceeds, and that's the collateral itself. Let's take a look at this multiple choice questions from farhatlectures.com. What is unique about PMSI, the purchase money security interest in secure transaction? What's special about this? What's special about this? Let's take a look at the answer choices. First of all, do you know what, you know, what, what is PMSI? Well, when you have a PMSI, you have a priority over anybody else because the property is perfected. Let's take a look at the answer choices. It's always subordinate to other security interests. Not at all. If you have a PMSI, subordinate means comes next or last. No, you always have a priority. So that's definitely A is out. It applies only to consumer goods. No, it doesn't only apply to consumer goods. It applies to practically all collateral. It doesn't have to be consumer goods. It can take priority, that's good, over other security interests if properly perfected. Yes, PMSI, if properly perfected, if you have this agreement before they leave the store, C is a good answer. It's the same as mechanics lien. No. Now, actually, mechanics lien, it's not even under Article 9 of the UCC. Therefore, the answer is, the best answer is C, 
it takes priority over other security interests if properly perfected. You want to you want to make sure you know the purchase money security interest PMSI. What should you do now? You want to go to Farhat Lectures, look at additional resources, multiple choice questions that's going to help you prepare for your CPA exam. Invest in yourself. The CPA exam is worth it. Good luck. Study hard. And of course, stay safe.